Chapter Seven of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. Chapter Seven Friends and Companions. Margaret Fuller, says William Henry Channing, was indeed the friend. This was her vocation. It was no less the vocation of Thoreau, though in a more lofty, unvarying, and serene manner. Literally, says the friend who best knew him, his views of friendship were high and noble. Those who loved him never had the least reason to regret it. He made no useless professions, never asked one of those questions that destroy all relation, but he was on the spot at the time, and had so much of human life in his keeping to the last that he could spare a breathing place for a friend. He meant friendship, and meant nothing else, and stood by it without the slightest abatement, not veering as a weathercock with each shift of a friend's fortune, nor like those who bury their early friendships in order to make room for fresh corpses. It is therefore impossible to sketch him by himself. He could have said, with Ellery Channing, O band of friends, ye breathe within this space, and the rough finish of humble man, by your kind touches, raises into art. His earliest companion was his brother John, a flowing generous spirit, as one describes him, for whom his younger brother never ceased to grieve. Walking among the Cohasset rocks, and looking at the scores of shipwrecked men from the Irish brig St. John in 1849, he said, a man can attend but one funeral in his life, can behold but one corpse. With him it was the funeral of John Thoreau in February 1842. They had made the voyage of the Concord and Merrimack together in 1839. They had walked and labored together, and invented Indian names for one another from boyhood. John was Sackham Hopeful of Hopewell, a sunny soul, always serene and loving. When publishing his first book in 1849, Henry dedicated it to this brother with the simple verse, Where'er thou sailest, who sailed with me, though now thou climbest loftier mounts, and fairer rivers dost ascend, be thou my muse, my brother John. John Thoreau's death was singular and painful. His brother could not speak of it without physical suffering, so that when he related it to his friend Ricketson, at New Bedford, he turned pale and was forced to go to the door for air. This was the only time Mr. Ricketson ever saw him show deep emotion. His sister Sophia once said, Henry rarely spoke of dear John. It pained him too much. He sent the following verses from Staten Island in May 1843, the year after John's death, in a letter to Helen. You will see that they apply to himself. Brother, where dost thou dwell? What sun shines for thee now? Dost thou, indeed, farewell, as we wished here below? What season didst thou find? Twas winter here. Are not the fates more kind than they appear? Is thy brow clear again, as in thy youthful years? And was that ugly pain the summit of thy fears? Yet thou wast cheery still. They could not quench thy fire. Thou didst abide their will, and then retire. Where chiefly shall I look to feel thy presence near? Along the neighboring brook may I thy voice still hear? Dost thou still haunt the brink of yonder river's tide? And may I ever think that thou art by my side? What bird wilt thou employ to bring me word of thee? For it would give them joy, T'would give them liberty. To serve their former lord With wing and minstrelsy, A sadder strain mixed with their song, They've slowlier built their nests, Since thou art gone, Their lively labor rests. Where is the finch, the thrush, I used to hear? Ah, they could well abide thy dying year. Now they no more return, I hear them not. They have remained to mourn 
or else forgot. Before the death of his brother, Thoreau had formed the friendship with Ellery Channing that was in some degree to replace the daily intimacy he had enjoyed with John Thoreau. This man of genius, and of the moods that sometimes make genius an unhappy boon, was a year younger than Thoreau when he came, in 1843, to dwell in Concord with his bride, a younger sister of Margaret Fuller. They lived first in a cottage near Mr. Emerson's, Thoreau being at that time an inmate of Mr. Emerson's household. Afterwards, in 1843, Mr. Channing removed to a hilltop some miles away, then to New York in 1844-45, to then to Europe for a few months, and finally to a house on the main street of the village, opposite the last residence of the Thoreau family, where Henry lived from 1850 till his death in 1862. In the garden of Mr. Channing's house, which lay on the river, Thoreau kept his boat, under a group of willows, and from that friendly harbor all his later voyages were made. At times they talked of occupying this house together. "'I have an old house in a garden patch,' says Channing. "'You have legs and arms, and we both need each other's companionship. These miserable cracks and crannies, which have made the wall of life look thin and fungus-like, will be cemented by the sweet and solid mortar of friendship.' They did, in fact, associate more closely than if they had lived in the same house. At the age of thirty-seven, when contemplating a removal from the neighborhood of his friend Thoreau, this humorous man of letters thus described himself and his tastes to another friend. I am a poet, or of a poetical temper or mood, with a very limited income both of brains and of monies. This world is rather a sour world, but as I am, equally with you, an admirer of Cooper, why should I not prove a sort of unnecessary addition to your neighborhood possibly? I may leave Concord, and my aim would be to get a small place in the vicinity of a large town, with some land, and, if possible, near to some one person, with whom I might in some measure fraternize. Come, my neighbor, thou hast now a new occupation, the setting up of a poet and literary man, one who loves old books, old garrets, old wines, old pipes, and, last not least, Cooper. We might pass the winter in comparing Vaorium editions of our favorite authors, and the summer in walking and horticulture. This is a grand scheme of life. All it requires is the house of which I spake. I think one in middle life feels adverse to change, and especially to local change. The lairs and penates love to establish themselves and desire no moving, but the fatal hour may come when, bidding one long, one last adieu to those weather-beaten penates, we sally forth with Don Quixote once more to strike our lances into some new truth or life or man. This hour did come, and the removal was made for a few months or years, during which the two friends met at odd intervals and in queer companionship but the sweet and solid mortar of friendship was never broken, though the wall of life came to look like a ruin. When, in Thoreau's last illness, Channing, in deep grief, said that a change had come over the dream of life, and that solitude began to peer out curiously from the dells and wood roads, Thoreau whispered, With his foot on the step of the other world, says Channing, it is better some things should end. Of their earlier friendship, and of Channing's poetic gift, so admirable, yet so little appreciated by his contemporaries, this mention occurs in a letter written by Thoreau in March 1856. I was surprised to hear the other day that Channing was in X. When he was here last, in December, I think, he said, like himself, in answer to my inquiry where he lived, that he did not know the name of the place. So it has remained in a degree of obscurity to me, I am rejoiced to hear that you are getting on so bravely with him and his verses. He and I, as you know, have been old cronies, fed the same flock by the fountain, shade, and rill, together both, ere the high lawns appeared, under the opening eyelids of the morn. We drove a field, and both together heard, etc. But, oh, the heavy change, now he is gone. The Channing you have seen and described is the real Simon Pure. You have seen him, 
many a good ramble may you have together you will see in him still more the same kind to attract and to puzzle you how to serve him most effectually has long been a problem with his friends perhaps it is left for you to solve it i suspect that the most of you or any one can do for him is to appreciate his genius to buy and read and cause others to buy and read his poems that is the hand which he has put forth to the world take hold of that review them if you can perhaps take the risk of publishing something more which he may write your knowledge of cooper will help you to know channing he will accept sympathy and aid but he will not bear questioning unless the aspects of the sky are particularly auspicious he will ever be reserved and enigmatic and you must deal with him at arm's length i have no secrets to tell you concerning him and do not wish to call obvious excellencies and defects by far-fetched names nor need i suggest how witty and poetic he is and what an inexhaustible fund of good fellowship you will find in him in the record of his winter visitors at walden thoreau had earlier made mention of channing who then lived on poncatesset hill two or three miles away from the hermitage he who came from farthest to my lodge says thoreau through deepest snows and most dismal tempests was a poet a farmer a hunter a soldier a reporter even a philosopher may be daunted but nothing can deter a poet for he is actuated by pure love who can predict his comings and goings his business calls him out at all hours even when doctors sleep we make that small house ring with boisterous mirth and resound with the murmur of much sober talk making amends then to walden vale for the long silences at suitable intervals there were regular salutes of laughter which might have been referred indifferently to the last uttered or the forthcoming jest in his week as thoreau floats down the concord and past the old manse he commemorates first hawthorne and then channing saying of the latter on poncatasset since with such delay down this still stream we took our meadowy way a poet wise hath settled whose fine ray doth faintly shine on concord's twilight day like those first stars whose silver beams on high shining more brightly as the day goes by most travellers cannot at first descry but eyes that want to range the evening sky these were true and deserved compliments but they availed little no more than did the praises of emerson in the dial and of hawthorne in his mosses to make channing known to the general reader some years after thoreau's death when writing to another friend this neglected poet said is there no way of disabusing s of the liking he has for the verses i used to write you probably know he is my only patron but that is no reason why he should be led astray there is no other test of the value of poetry but its popularity my verses have never secured a single reader but s he really believes i think in these so-called verses but they are not good they are wholly unknown and unread and always will be mediocre poetry is worse than nothing and mine is not even mediocre I have presented S. with the last set of those little books there is, to have them bound, if he will. He can keep them as a literary curio, and in his old age amuse himself with thinking, how could ever I have liked these? Yet this self-disparaging poet was he who wrote, If my bark sinks, tis to another sea. And he who cried to his companions, Ye heavy-hearted mariners, who sail this shore ye patient ye who labour sitting at the sweeping oar and see afar the flashing seagulls play on the free waters and the glad bright day twine with his hand the spray from out of your dreariness from your heart weariness i speak for i am yours on these grey shores it is he also who has best told in prose and verse what thoreau was in his character and his literary art in dedicating to his friend henry the poem called near home published in eighteen fifty eight channing thus addresses him 
modest and mild and kind who never spurned the needing from thy door door of thy heart which is a palace gate temperate and faithful in whose word the world might trust sure to repay unvexed by care unawed by fortune's nod slave to no lord nor coward to thy peers long shalt thou live not in this feeble verse this sleeping age but in the roll of heaven and at the bar of that high court where virtue is in place there thou shalt fitly rule and read the laws of that supremer state writ jove's behest and even old saturn's chronicle works ne'er hesiod saw types of all things and portraitures of all whose golden leaves roll back the ages doors and summon up unsleeping truths by which wheels on heaven's prime in these majestic lines suggestive of dante of shakespeare and of milton yet fitting by the force of imagination to the simplicity and magnanimity that thoreau had displayed one reads the secret of that character which made the concord recluse first declare to the world the true mission of john brown whose friend he had been for a few years of alcott and of hawthorne of margaret fuller and horace greenley he had been longer the friend and in the year before he met brown he had stood face to face with walt whitman in brooklyn mr alcott's testimony to thoreau's worth and friendliness has been constant if i were to proffer my earnest prayer to the gods for the greatest of all human privileges he said one day after returning from an evening spent at walden with thoreau it should be for the gift of a severely candid friend to most the presence of such is painfully irksome they are lovers of present reputation and not of that exaltation of soul which friends and discourse were given to awaken and cherish in us intercourse of this kind i have found possible with my friends emerson and thoreau and the evenings passed in their society during these winter months have realized my conception of what friendship when great and genuine owes to and takes from its objects no less emphatic was thoreau's praise of mr abbott after these long winter evenings with him in the hut one of the last of the philosophers he writes in walden connecticut gave him to the world he peddled first her wares and afterwards as he declares his brains these he peddles still prompting god and disgracing man bearing for fruit his brain only like the nut its kernel i think he must be the man of the most faith of any alive his words and attitudes always suppose a better state of things than other men are acquainted with and he will be the last man to be disappointed as the ages revolve he has no venture in the present but though comparatively degraded now laws unsuspected by most will take effect and masters of families and rulers will come to him for advice a true friend of man almost the only friend of human progress he is perhaps the sanest man and has the fewest crotchets of any i chance to know the same yesterday to-day and to-morrow of yore we had sauntered and talked and effectually put the world behind us for he was pledged to no institution in it free-born ingenuous great looker great expector to converse with whom was a new england night's entertainment ah such discourse we had hermit and philosopher and the old settler i have spoken of we three it expanded and racked my little house nor did thoreau participate in such discourse at walden alone but frequented mr alcott's conversations at mr emerson's house in concord at hawthorne's in salem at marston watson's in plymouth at daniel ricketson's in new bedford and once or twice in boston and new york with mr alcott and alice carey thoreau visited horace greeley at chappaqua in eighteen fifty six and with mr alcott alone he called on walt whitman in brooklyn the same year between hawthorne and thoreau ellery channing was perhaps the interpreter for they had not very much in common though friendly and mutually respectful the boat in which thoreau made his voyage of eighteen thirty nine on the concord and merrimac came afterwards into hawthorne's possession 
and was the frequent vehicle for Channing and Hawthorne, as they made those excursions which Hawthorne has commemorated. Channing also has commemorated those years when Hawthorne spent the happiest hours of his life in the old manse, to which he had removed soon after his marriage in 1842. There in the old grey house, whose end we see, half peeping through the golden willow's veil, whose graceful twigs make foliage through the year, my Hawthorne dwelt, a scholar of rare worth, the gentlest man that kindly nature drew. New England's Chaucer, Hawthorne fitly lives, his tall, compacted figure, ably strung, to urge the Indian chase or guide the way, softly reclining neath the aged elm, some still rock looked out upon the scene, as much a part of nature as itself. In July 1860, writing to his sister Sophia among New Hampshire mountains, Thoreau said, Mr. Hawthorne has come home. I went to meet him the other evening, at Mr. Emerson's, and found that he had not altered, except that he was looking pretty brown after his voyage. He is as simple and childlike as ever. This was upon the return of Hawthorne from his long residence abroad in England, Portugal, and Italy. Thoreau died two years before Hawthorne, and they are buried within a few feet of each other in the Concord Cemetery, their funerals having proceeded from the same parish church nearby. Of Thoreau's relations with Emerson, this is not the place to speak in full. It was, however, the most important, if not the most intimate, of all his friendships, and that out of which the others mainly grew. Their close acquaintance began in 1837. In the latter part of April 1841, Thoreau became an intimate of Mr. Emerson's house, and remained there till, in the spring of 1843, he went for a few months to be the tutor of Mr. William Emerson's sons at Staten Island. In 1840, while teaching school in Concord, Thoreau seems to have been fully admitted into that circle of which Emerson, Alcott, and Margaret Fuller were the leaders. In May 1840, this circle met, as it then did frequently, at the house of Mr. Emerson, to converse on the inspiration of the prophet and bard, the nature of poetry, and the causes of sterility of poetic inspiration in our age and country. Mr. Alcott, in his diary, has preserved a record of this meeting, and some others of the same kind. It seems that on this occasion, Thoreau being not quite twenty-three years old, Mr. Alcott forty-one, Mr. Emerson thirty-seven, and Miss Fuller thirty, all these were present, and also Jones Very, the Salem poet, Dr. F. H. Hedge, Dr. C. A. Bartol, Dr. Caleb Stetson, and Robert Bartlett of Plymouth. Bartlett and Very were graduates of Harvard a year before Thoreau, and afterwards tutors there. Indeed, all the company except Alcott were Cambridge scholars. For Margaret Fuller, without entering college, had breathed in the learned air of Cambridge, and gone beyond the students who were her companions. I find no earlier record of Thoreau's participation in these meetings, but afterward he was often present. In May 1839, Mr. Alcott had held one of his conversations at the house of Thoreau's mother, but no mention is made of Henry taking part in it. At a conversation in Concord in 1846, one April evening, Thoreau came in from his Walden hermitage and protested with some vehemence against Mr. Alcott's declaration that Jesus stood in a more tender and intimate nearness to the heart of mankind than any character in life or literature. Thoreau thought he asserted this claim for the fair Hebrew in exaggeration, yet he could say in the weak, it is necessary not to be Christian to appreciate the beauty and significance of the life of Christ. This earliest of his volumes, like most of his writings, is a record of his friendships, and in it we find that high-toned, paradoxical essay on love and friendship which has already been quoted. To read this literally, as Channing says, would be to accuse him of stupidity. He gossips there of a high imaginary world, but its tone is no higher than was the habitual feeling of Thoreau towards his friends, or that sentiment which he inspired in them. In Mr. Alcott's diary for March 16, 1847, he writes, two years before the week was made public, this evening I passed with Thoreau at his hermitage on Walden. 
and he reads me some passages from his manuscript volume entitled a week on the concord and merrimack rivers the book is purely american fragrant with the life of new england woods and streams and could have been written nowhere else especially i am touched by his sufficiency and soundness his aboriginal vigor as if a man had once more come into nature who knew what nature meant him to do with her virgil and white of selborne and isaac walton and yankee settler all in one i came home at midnight through the woody snow paths and slept with a pleasing dream that presently the press would give me two books to be proud of emerson's poems and thoreau's week this high anticipation of the young author's career was fully shared by emerson himself who everywhere praised the genius of thoreau and when in england in eighteen forty eight listened readily to a proposition from dr chapman the publisher for a new magazine to be called the atlantic and printed at the same time in london and in boston whose chief contributors in england should be frode garth wilkinson arthur hugh clough and perhaps carlyle and in new england emerson thoreau alcott the channings theodore parker and elliot cabot the plan came to nothing but it may have been some reminiscence of it which nine years afterward gave its name to that boston magazine the atlantic monthly mr emerson's letter was dated in london april twentieth eighteen forty eight and said i find chapman very anxious to publish a journal common to old and new england as was long ago proposed frode and clo and other oxians would gladly conspire let the massachusetts quarterly give place to this and we should have two legs and bestride the sea here i know so many good-minded people that i am sure will gladly combine but what do i or what does any friend of mine in america care for a journal not enough i fear to secure an energetic work on that side i have a letter from cabot lately and do write him to-day tis certain the massachusetts quarterly review will fail unless henry thoreau and alcott and channing and newcomb the four-legged visages fly to the rescue i am sorry that alcott's editor the dumont of our bentham the baruch of our jeremiah is so slow to be born in eighteen forty six before mr emerson went abroad we find thoreau whose own hut beside walden had been built and inhabited for a year sketching a design for a lodge which mr emerson then proposed to build on the opposite shore it was to be a retreat for study and writing at the summit of a ledge with a commanding prospect over the level country towards monadnock and wachusett in the west and northwest for this lookout mr alcott added a story to thoreau's sketch but the hermitage was never built and the plan finally resulted in a rustic summer-house erected by alcott with some aid from thoreau in mr emerson's garden in eighteen forty seven to forty eight humbler friends than poets and philosophers sometimes share the companionship of these brethren of concord in february eighteen forty seven mr alcott who was then a woodman laboring on his hillside with his own axe where afterwards hawthorne wandered and mused thus notes in his diary an incident not unusual in the town our friend the fugitive who has shared now a week's hospitalities with us sawing and piling my wood feels this new trust of freedom yet unsafe here in new england and so has left us this morning for canada we supplied him with the means of journeying and bade him godspeed to a freer land his stay with us has given image and a name to the dire entity of slavery it was this slave no doubt who had lodged for a while in thoreau's walden hut my own acquaintance with thoreau did not begin with our common hostility to slavery which afterwards brought us most clearly together but sprang from the accident of my editing for a few weeks the harvard magazine a college monthly in eighteen fifty four to fifty five in which appeared a long review of walden and the week in acknowledgment of this review which was laudatory and made many quotations from his two volumes thoreau whom i had never seen called at my room in holworthy hall cambridge in january eighteen fifty five and left there in my absence a copy of the week 
with a message implying that it was for the writer of the magazine article. It so happened that I was in the college library when Thoreau was calling on me, and when he came directly after to the library, someone present pointed him out to me as the author of Walden. I was then a senior in college, and soon to go on my winter vacation, in course of which I wrote to Thoreau from my native town as follows. Hampton Falls, New Hampshire, January 30th, 55. My dear sir, I have had it in mind to write you a letter ever since the day when you visited me, without my knowing it, at Cambridge. I saw you afterwards at the library, but refrained from introducing myself to you, in the hope that I should see you later in the day. But as I did not, will you allow me to seek you out, when next I come to Concord? The author of the criticism in the Harvard magazine is Mr. Morton of Plymouth, a friend and pupil of your friend, Marston Watson, of that old town. Accordingly, I gave him the book which you left with me, judging that it belonged to him. He received it with delight, as a gift of value in itself, and the more valuable for the sake of the giver. We who at Cambridge look toward Concord as a sort of mecca for our pilgrimages are glad to see that your last book finds such favor with the public. It has made its way where your name has rarely been heard before, and the inquiry, who is Mr. Thoreau, proves that the book has in part done its work. For my own part, I thank you for the new light it shows me, the aspects of nature in, and for the marvelous beauty of your descriptions. At the same time, if any one should ask me what I think of your philosophy, I should be apt to answer that it is not worth a straw. Whenever again you visit Cambridge, be assured, sir, it would give me much pleasure to see you at my room. There or in Concord, I hope soon to see you, if I may intrude so much on your time. Believe me always, yours very truly, F. B. Sanborn. This note, which I had entirely forgotten, and of which I trust my friend soon forgave the pertness, came to me recently among his papers. With one exception, it is the only letter that passed between us, I think, in an acquaintance of more than seven years. Some six weeks after its date, I went to live in Concord, and happened to take rooms in Mr. Channing's house just across the way from Thoreau's. I met him more than once in March 1855, but he did not call on my sister and me until the 11th of April, when I made the following brief note of his appearance. Tonight we had a call from Mr. Thoreau, who came at eight and stayed till ten. He talked about Latin and Greek, which he thought ought to be studied, and about other things. In his tones and gestures he seems to me to imitate Emerson, so that it was annoying to listen to him, though he said many good things. He looks like Emerson, too, coarser, but with something of that serenity and sagacity which E. has. Thoreau looks eminently sagacious, like a sort of wise, wild beast. He dresses plainly, wears a beard in his throat, and has a brown complexion. A month or two later, my diary expanded this sketch a little with other particulars. He is a little undersized, with a huge Emersonian nose, bluish-gray eyes, brown hair, and a ruddy, weather-beaten face, which reminds me of some shrewd and honest animals, some retired philosophical woodchuck, or magnanimous fox. He dresses very plainly, wears his collar turned over like Mr. Emerson, we young collegians then wearing ours upright, and often an old dress coat, broad in the skirts and by no means a fit. He walks about with a brisk, rustic air and never seems tired. Notwithstanding the slow admiration that these trivial comments indicated, our friendship grew apace, and for two years or more I dined with him almost daily, and often joined in his walks and river voyages, or swam with him in some of our numerous Concord waters. In 1857 I introduced John Brown to him, then a guest at my house, and in 1859, the evening before Brown's last birthday, we listened together to the old captain's last speech in the Concord Town Hall. The events of that year and the next brought us closely together, and I found him the staunchest of friends. This chapter might easily be extended into a volume, so long was the list of his companions and so intimate and perfect his relations with them, at least on his own side. A truth-speaker he, said Emerson at his funeral, K. 
capable of the most deep and strict conversation, a physician to the wounds of any soul, a friend, knowing not only the secret of friendship, but also worshipped by those few persons who resorted to him as their confessor and prophet, and knew the deep value of his mind and great heart. His soul was made for the noblest society. He had, in a short life, exhausted the capabilities of this world. Wherever there is knowledge, wherever there is virtue, wherever there is beauty, he will find a home. End of chapter 7